Hey, this is Adam Driscoll, and today we are looking at uh, what you need to know about Pester 5. So, uh, when I was upgrading my Pester 4 test, Pester 5 tests, I saw a lot of like information online on like how to upgrade your Pester 4 test to Pester 5, and this is just kind of my uh, interpretation of what you need to kind of know when you're going from Pester 4 to Pester 5. So Pester is a uh, testing framework for PowerShell, and uh, kind of how it looks is like this. So we have a describe block, which is usually describe some sort of commandlet, a context block, which is describing particular functionality for a particular commandlet, and then an it block, which is your kind of individual test. So I have a module here that's called um, module.psm1. It contains a single function that has get banana. You pass in the how old your banana is. If it's older than five days, then it's rotten. So I've written some tests to verify that this you know function works as expected. So if I call get banana with uh, age days of ten, it should be rotten. So that is what you're seeing here. It should be true. Um, and if I execute this, what you'll see in my terminal window here in Visual Studio Code is that uh, this test passed because it returned rotten, which is correct. So that's kind of like a Pester 4 and Pester 5 thing. Like it, that works the exact same way. Um, but we're going to start running into problems is kind of uh, where you have initialization and teardown code is kind of the biggest thing in Pester 5 that I encountered. Um, so the Pester 5 works in a little different way than Pester 4 does. Uh, in Pester 5, it actually has a, di a discovery phase and then a run phase. So the discovery phase actually determines what tests are actually defined within your files. And that can include tests that are auto-generated um, based on like uh, loops and that kind of thing. And then it has a run phase where it actually executes those tests. So if you look at this test that I've set up here, I actually have some write host calls that will make it a little more obvious to see the discovery versus run phase. So I have a uh, write host call here at the top in my discovery phase. And then I have a couple uh, blocks here. So I have a before all, after all, before each, and after each. Before all is called before all tests are run. After all is called after all tests have finished. Before each is called before each test, and after each is called after each test. I have another uh, write host call that is within this describe block, but um, not within the context block. And finally, I have a write host call that's uh, within the context block, but not within the it block. So I've named those discovery because those are all the like locations where discovery happens, but run doesn't happen. Uh, and then finally, I have two it blocks, and I have a write host call that um, pretty much prints out run uh, inside those tests. So if I were actually to run this, what you're going to see in the output window is, um, uh, we're going to do that again just so that you can see that it's printed there. So Pester actually will say starting discovery in one file. And you can see it called discovery, discovery, discovery. Those were the three discovery places that I put. So line three here at kind of the global scope within the describe block. Uh, at line 18, and then within my context block at line 20. And then when it starts running the tests, those aren't called anymore. So if you have put any initialization code in those places, during the actual test ex execution, it will not call those um, again. Instead, it calls the uh, various um, other blocks that were defined. So before all, you can see here that it called before all first, and then before each, uh, it called that. Next, it called run, which was my first test. It is rotten. Then it called after each. It didn't call before all again because it's running the next test and it doesn't need to uh, do the before all. So it does um, before each and then after each and then after all. So um, this is kind of one way to kind of like uh, visualize how Pester 5 is running tests. It has the discovery phase and then it has the run phase. So you need to make sure that you're actually calling um, things that do initialization, like setting variables and potentially importing modules and that kind of thing in these types of blocks, rather than just kind of putting it at the root like this. So one example of that is like, this is now incorrect. Like this used to be fine in PowerShell or uh, Pester 4. Uh, you, you set a variable here and you can use it. And what's interesting is like, 
in a lot of places, this will pass. Like if I just run this by itself, it's going to pass because discovery runs, it sets a variable, then the uh, text, test execution runs, and um, that variable is available. But if you run it as a suite, you're going to start running into like really weird stuff. Like why doesn't this work, you know? Because discovery runs, then a bunch of um, tests start running, and that variable might be modified after discovery. So you don't want to set it at a global scope like this. The actual correct way to do that is actually to do something like this, where you have um, uh, describe and then a before all, and that's where you would set your variable. You wouldn't set it at the global scope because this always happens in kind of the running context. Um, and uh, then it would work as expected. One thing you're gonna notice though that like really annoyed me the, the, when I first started using um, Pester 7 is like, I'm setting this variable, it's available inside um, my test, but PS Script Analyzer is like, hey, you're setting this variable and I'm using it. So um, what you can do is actually kind of suppress those for your tests. Uh, you can do it at, uh, either kind of at a global scope for your whole machine or just for tests by using um, this uh, diagnostic code analysis suppress message attribute. And if you use the PS use declared vars more than assignments uh, suppression, it will actually get rid of that annoying little uh, squiggle for you. So uh, that was kind of important for me because uh, I would set, have a bunch of like, you know, setup code and it'd be complaining a bunch about the variables that I was setting. Um, another thing that is a little different then because we have this whole like discovery versus run phase is um, the ability to set test cases. So you, you could do this before where you'd have like a for each and you'd have an it block and you'd pass in uh, the age into each one of your tests, but because there's these two phases, um, kind of what you want to do is use this parameter here called test cases for each one of your it blocks. So tools that actually like uh, display the test cases that are defined within your um, pester tests will actually be able to run the discovery phase on this and see that there should be 10 tests here. So I'm going one through 10 and um, I'm setting this age days variable rather than age. Um, and the discovery phase will run, but it won't actually run the test. And then the tool like the VS Code Pester uh, extension will actually be able to run the discovery phase, generate you know the output that looks like that um, based on this loop. And then when the test runs, it's actually using this test cases uh, hash table here. So each property in the hash table is actually going to show up as a variable inside your it block. So you can see here I'm using age days in my tests. And if I run that, what you're going to see is that it actually runs um, 10 tests because I went uh, 1 through 10 and uh, my 10 tests passed because I have the correct logic for my test and uh, the um, function I'm testing. So that's kind of like a overview of kind of how the discovery versus run um, phase works now. But the other thing that I kind of want to touch on is the um, invoke pester commandlet. So this is another thing that's been kind of heavily changed in pester 5 over pester 4. Uh, you used to have a, like a lot of like parameters on pester or invoke pester to do certain things like code coverage and um, test results and that kind of thing. Um, you technically can still use them. It'll complain and say like, you know, this is deprecated. It's going to be going away soon. Uh, but kind of the, the new way of doing that is creating this hash table that has all the options on it and then passing that as a configuration. So you can see here I'm setting up a pester configuration. Uh, I'm setting the run to the current directory pretty much. Uh, if there is an error in my should, I want to continue. I don't want all the tests to fail. If it hits one error, I want to know everything that's wrong. Uh, I've turned on code coverage. I've set it to this format, it's UTF-8, it's enabled. Uh, and then my output path for test results is this XML file, and it's set to any unit XML. So I could consume that in a CI environment of some kind, like Azure DevOps or GitHub Actions, something like that. And that's enabled as well. And then I pass that to new pester configuration and invoke that with invoke pester. So that's going to invoke my test suite with all these configuration options. And this is kind of what you would see in uh, a CI environment or something like that, where you're actually testing it and consuming that by some automation and displaying it. So if I execute that, you're going to see that 
has a bunch of stuff. Uh, I'll put some, you know, code coverage information. My code coverage is pretty low. Uh, and if you look at the files that were outputted, you'll see that I got my pester coverage XML file that could be consumed by some system and uh, my pester test XML file that could be consumed by some system. And since this, those are using like kind of standard formats, uh, you know, a lot of uh, systems could consume that and display it in nice charts and that kind of thing or, you know, fail the build. So, um, I know there's a lot of other things that are different in Pester 5, but uh, as like a, it's not super advanced Pester user, like I don't usually use mocks or that kind of thing, or like in-module scope. Uh, these were the things that I kind of needed to know to get up and running in Pester 5 um, from Pester 4. So, it wasn't too hard. You just need to, get, the biggest thing for me was understanding the difference between um, discovery and run phases. And once you kind of uh, grok that, you're able to, you know, transition your test from Pester 4 to Pester 5. So uh, hopefully this was a useful video on kind of the new features of Pester 5. And if you really liked it, uh, subscribe to this channel.